that's right. Yep, okay. that's perfect. So, I do you buy the picture? Okay. I try to sure you get an email. What will happen is that everybody will create a damn password. So, okay. you can, after you visit that, change the password. Okay. Yeah, and then if you want, when you get your real account, just like this one, so we can merge both. So, you don't need to. Oh, no, but I might. My... No, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just for you don't have to yeah. have two usernames. Testing, testing, testing. Oh, only. There you go. I wasn't sure if you be here on time, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, now it's recording. So I had um, two slides in the kids. Okay. So it's um, it's forty percent and then uh, for branches. Okay. Uh, but I don't know. No, I'm going to use those as. Uh, Experience that made no sense. So, we'll okay, okay, so you will find two extras no, that are not there. I was going to put more stuff inside. Yeah. Um, so, everything is ready. Uh, If you want, um, can remind them of the Linux in the next. So hard, but yeah. You know. Okay. Apparently, capital money can be converted into people money. So.
All right. Is it on the chat already? Yeah. Okay. Chat, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's no uh, no way around it. We... They are going uh, actually going to ask because they already. Well, I know, and and you know, any other week we just press Jason to push them through. Well, that's true. They have to say yes. Oh, that's true. So, and I find this. Yeah. Anyway, it's annoying. Yeah. It's a, It's a, It's yeah. They're working on it. Let me put it that way, right? Yeah. Ready to go. It's full screen. Good. So no more problems. Okay, good. We'll see how we uh, how we do today. There were, yeah, there were there were there were a lot this morning. I didn't look at them. I just yeah, yeah. counted the twenty something. And oh yeah, I need fake users. So that, that, how can I test whether how it looks for a user, right? Everything is different. And they in they see the assignment. Well, that sh there should be a way to make yourself just okay, show me what the user shows, right? Yeah, and, and they and actually a newer version of that software can, but it's not drop in compatible with all the changes we made. So that's because that one has an edit mode and a non edit mode. So that's right. You either see it as everybody sees it when they're logged in. Or your editing, which makes a lot more sense. Yeah. But, so I can't blame them because they fixed it, but we're we don't have. Hmm? Is it free? No, it's absolutely free. Yeah, uh, yeah this is uh, so many. Like, we we basically need like four uh, work study students full time that already know the system. So we could, uh, if we hired the last three all together, and we had them full time, maybe. <laughs> So it's it's not a small task. Yeah, the front lines must must be able to do something. Yeah, that's all of them. No. Yeah, this is not too bad. Yeah, that's not too bad. So we're going to start. Good morning, everybody. And what we'll start with is actually just a recap of Git, because it was done a little bit fast at the end of the last lecture. And if we want you to be able to use it, that's not good to leave it that way, like that. So. so we looked at Git is for version control. And it's just a way to keep track of your changes, uh, be able to go back to previous changes if you broke something, uh, be able to have separate um, versions of the, of the code that you could possibly merge again or pick different parts. Uh, you could have an experimental branch and, a, and, and one that you feel is ready for other people to use. So you can do a lot of things with version control. Uh, and it's, it's sort of automated, which means that you go, go away from the idea of having just snapshots and copying all your files and then direct these version one, version two, version three, uh, which, which would work, uh, but wastes a lot of time and doesn't give you this, this ease of seeing what you did exactly. So it makes for a better organiz organized uh, code development. It makes it easier to collaborate because all of the history is there. So when you share your code with somebody, they can see what you did and why you did it. Um, this can be very helpful. So the idea is it, it, that we're going to look at is, is, is suppose, that you, suppose that you go back to the previous version and, and uh, proceed from there. So Git, I hope you've, in, you've by now installed it. Uh, we'll see how to do these things, or we saw how to do these things. Um, saw this last time. Um, 
you still have trouble installing it, just send us an email, and uh, we can try and help you. So Git is, is uh, somewhat peculiar uh, because it tries to be very flexible. So the first thing you want to do when you start using Git is, is initialize your repository. So if you do a local repository, this basically a repository attached to the code on your local machine, it creates this .git directory, and that contains all of this stuff, the history, any branches, any uh, reverts, any, all, anything you committed, all the files that you have, in, in as, as storage efficient a way as, as possible. So if you made a small change to a file, that small change is stored, not the whole file again. So it's not, that's not bad. And it's .git because dot file, dot .directories are hidden in Linux by default, and so um, they don't show up if you just do an ls. By the way, um, if you're still a little bit new on the Linux shell, we have a, a Linux shell course coming up uh, in the near future. And so check the education site and, and see if you can come. So only when you do ls-a, which means all, it will show you this, this hidden directory. And then you have to add all the files explicitly. So you can have files in the directory that aren't tracked at all. You have to say which files to track and which, which don't. Um, and that's because some files might be log files, auxiliary files. There's no point storing them because they change every time you run. And, and that's not your code, right? So you just store what you want. And you, so you add them explicitly. And then once they're added, they're only put in a list of, hey, this is, this is the stuff that you want to add. But they're not actually committed yet. They're not actually stored yet. It's more of a, a list creation command. Uh, it puts it in a staging area. And then commit does the real thing. Anything you, anytime you commit, you have to say why, or you have to give it a message. And so uh, the first message is often first commit for my repository. That's OK, although I'd like to add also a comment on what this code is supposed to uh, do or what the plan is. Try to be uh, helpful in those commits, say why they were committed or what was changed on a sort of high level functional uh, uh, level. So if you just add it, uh, capability to read from a file rather than read input from keyboard, well, that's something you would put in there, right? Uh, you can see what you did by git log. And so we have made this one commit. And it has this funny ID. It's, it's huge and long. Uh, it is one of the reasons is that long is that's pretty much unique for any commit that you do. And if you ever wanted to come back to that commit, to that point, so you've gone on somewhere in your code and say, oh, something happened when I did the first commit. I want to go back to the first commit. I could just check out this particular commit by that number. So it's good to have that number there. Uh, when everything is fine and hunky-dory, you never use those. But if you have to go back or have to merge specific things, that's where those become uh, useful. Removing is kind of like adding, but you have to have git do it. Because if you just remove it, uh, depending on how you set it up, git may or may not realize this file is gone. Uh, and then you have to commit that again. So you commit the removal of the file. The file, the file is away. The file is gone, yes. Right. There are tricky ways to get it out of the repository, but keep it. But yeah, that's so, so that's the basic way of working with Git. And, and that's most of what we'll have you do uh, in, in the course. But there's a few advanced things that I think are useful to show, just so that you know why you would just want to start with in the first place and not do your uh, directory copying version 1, version 2, version 3 kind of version control. Um, and so one, a little bit of the power uh, of, of Git is, uh, is going to be demonstrated in these advanced slides. That's what the ADV is supposed to stand for. So you could have different branches of your code that either do different things or uh, have an experimental site in that aren't, aren't supposed to be used. Or, uh, and so you, know, you can imagine, in the, if you're a bit of a Trekkie, uh, several versions and branches off of the main trunk of this, uh, this series. And if you don't like it, you can go back. So uh, I've added the comments of how you work with branches. But basically, whenever you're at a point where you want to make a branch, you say, well, let's create a branch. Um, here we go, new branch. And funnily enough, although you created it, um, you're still on your old branch. So you kind of have to check out. Um, similar, similarly to saying, I add a file and then I commit it, I have to 
make a branch and then actually go to that branch. It's kind of funny, but that's how it works. Um, just general syntax for reference. But. So that's all local. But what if your <laughs> stuff lives on a remote machine? And the, the, really power, the real power of Git is that it can do this sort of distributed version control. You don't have to have one server. And every time you clone your project, you have the full history of that code, including branches. So suppose we had a project here. We added it. We committed something. Um, we can add an or This is supposed to be one line. Um, so you can add an origin. You can say, you know what, this project is supposed to live here. So this is on some server called example.com. So whether you have your own laptop or whether you have a lab's laptop or whether it's Synet, uh, this is sort of how you would communicate with that. You give your username, you give your host, and then you give the Git repository. And then once you've said that you want to add that repository, so add the remote, you can push things there. You can say, just push it there. And then it's there too, which means that now I can do things like, yeah, like this. I can make other copies from that by cloning. So I can clone from anywhere, really, uh, a Git project. So when I clone, I get a local copy of the whole repository, the code, the repository. I can make changes. And depending on the permissions that I have, I can push those back to, to the server. And so this could be, mean that several people can be working on the code at the same time, see all of the history. And only when they try pushing, it might, it might be such that there are now conflicts. Um, in real uh, applications, what people tend to do if they do have separate uh, development is that they clone it, then they create a branch for themselves so they can't mess anything up. And then they merge those branches at the end. But it's, it's essentially the same idea. Um, once there are changes on a server and you just want to get those changes, you've already cloned it, you can just do a, it's sort of a mini clone. You can do git pull and just pulls the changes. That's useful. You can see the differences between the local version and the, uh, the remote one with git diff. Um, so there's a, the, there's, it's a very versatile tool for, for collaboration for remote repositories, even though we're going to only touch the surface of it here. I just wanted you to know that that's, that that's possible. And that's, of course, not all that's possible. So here's a little bit of a <laughs> everything that Git can do. So since it's so versatile and you're going to want some sort of version control anyway, you might as well use Git. The, the default way of using it, the simple way of using it, local uh, repository, add your files, uh, commit them, have a log that says where you were, and be able to go back. Uh, that's, that's all you'll need initially. Uh, don't put things in that, that shouldn't be there, like a log file uh, if you, or even executables. You have your code. A make file, as we saw, will build your, your executable. The executable isn't a source file. You don't have to keep the track, track of the changes. And it actually isn't good for keeping track of changes in binary files anyway. Right? They are not organized line by line. So uh, basically, everything is one big line. And everything, every time something changes, it will save just as the line that changed but that's the whole file. So, um, and if you want more information on Git, this article is pretty nice. Uh, and then, just as you can have your code on a remote machine, you can also have it on a remote server that isn't even yourself, your own, uh, like GitHub or Bitbucket. Bitbucket. These are uh, available. You can put your code on there. When you put your code on there, everybody sees it. It is just completely public. Uh, they can clone it. They can't push back necessarily, but people can request uh, for uh, for a merge for 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 upgrades. So it's a way of of publishing your code while still using a version control. So at the same time, being a version control, it, it gives you a very easy way to publish your code as well. Okay. Any any last questions? I mean. Well, any questions about Git before we go on to what was supposed to be the topic today? Yeah? Uh, Everything in the current directory, yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. So it's, so it's only a good idea if you haven't compiled anything yet to do that. So it's a, 
it's a simple way to do, add everything, but it's not, unless you have only a few files and you know what, what that dot means, it's just a shorthand. The next one. So today's lecture, we'll see how far we get. It was supposed to be about arrays. Um, so forget about Git for a second. Take a breath. So we've done the Git review. We're going to look at arrays. And um, this is, to some extent, we have to do this because we chose C++ as a language. And it's not per se that C++ is bad at arrays. It's just not particularly good at it before you use libraries. So we're going to, use, we're going to see what arrays are like in C++. Because arrays are everywhere in scientific computing. Um, so we're going to first look at the general case. We're going to use, look at how they relate to pointers. So pointers will come back uh, briefly. And uh, we'll, spend some time looking at multidimensional arrays. And here's where C++ does absolutely not shine at all. Uh, multidimensional arrays are not well supported uh, in the language itself. Um, but they're very common. Matrices are two-dimensional. Uh, we might have a grid in 3D. Uh, we might have a grid in four dimensions if we have space-time simulations. Um, and so since they're not supported very well in the language, there are some very nice libraries that sort of fill that niche. And I'll show at least two of them um, that will uh, help you not have to deal with every bit of detail. Um, that doesn't change how arrays are dealt with in the language. And so we'll have to go over that anyway. I did that one. So we have to do things carefully. Um, it's, it's because C derived from C, which is low level, and you can. You can mess things up, and so we're going to try and tell you how not to do, uh, how, how sort of to avoid that. So we've seen static arrays last week. Static arrays or automatic arrays are where we basically say, oh, I'll just add square bra braces, uh, brackets to my, in, my, my type, and I can even initialize these things, just give it four numbers, and that's OK. Um, there are some various ways you can do things. There's also various ways that apparently you can do things. So you would think that you could just say, well, I have my array here of four, and let me just assign four numbers to it. That is not allowed. Um, assigning hands to cards is not allowed either. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that are funnily not allowed. So when things are allowed, they seem to make sense. This is very sensible. Um, some of them are, are extendable. Here's four, 5, 500 integers. Um, they're all zero. That's what this means. Um, and there's some nice ways in which you can say, OK, four integers here. You figure out how many there are. So I'm not going to tell you what the dimension is. Um, so it's, it's a little bit half in terms of, of what you can and cannot do. But I've already said last week that um, automatic arrays aren't particularly good to use in general anyway, because their, their size is limited to something that you don't really control very well. Or if you do, you have to sort of know your operating system very well. And so large arrays are especially not, uh, not good using, using this way. Another way, another thing that is very sort of eh about arrays in C, C++, is that Although I can do this new and delete stuff to get arrays, and this is better, uh, there's nothing checking whether I go out of bounds. Um, so I can just use this array A here, which has five elements, and then just go off the end of the array in this loop, and just count until uh, A6. A6 doesn't exist. But I compile it, and the compiler doesn't complain. And I run it, and still there's no complaints. But well, what does happen is that, although I fill this with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, the two elements that I access that are extra are basically filled with, with whatever garbage it finds. So what it does is, OK, well, look, we initialize the pointer with this new statement. So I have the pointer to the first element, and then it starts fetching these elements. And then once it's past the end of the array, it'll just fetch whatever is in the next memory location. 
It doesn't care. You know, what's there? Let's see. And so apparently there was a zero in the next one. But then the, the seventh element had this you know, 9 million 428 116, right? Um, and then that, so that's basically what's going on when you go past the end of the array. It doesn't tell you that things are wrong. The compiler doesn't tell you, and running it doesn't necessarily tell you. Sometimes it does. If you go way, way out of bounds, you end up in parts of memory that aren't, uh, aren't accessible by your program. So the operating system sets some limits on how far your program is allowed to go. This is a safety measure. It's a good thing. Uh, but that means that instead of getting garbage, which is bad enough, you get the segmentation fault, which is just plain mysterious. So both of them are show you that you're, do, you're going past the end of the array. And it's, it's because we're just using a pointer. It doesn't store the size. Uh, this gets additionally uh, uh, augmented when you try and pass arrays to a function. So I've created this wonderful array here of cookies. Uh, it has eight cookies, and I want to sum all the cookies together in this function. If I pass it to the function, um, it becomes a pointer, which means it basically only remembers the f where the first element is and doesn't know anything about the size, which means any time I do that, I have to add the integer. Uh, an integer that says how big this, the, the, the array is. When I do that, everything works just fine. Uh, but every time I pass an array, I would have to pass two arguments. So it'll work. Total cookies eaten is 255. But because of this conversion to a pointer, I can do some very, very nasty things. So basically, I'm passing this array. And in the sum, and I've changed the sum r function here to add 10 to element 0. It's an arbitrary thing, but it's something that, I'm, that I can do. And if I do that, that reflects back to the original array. So the second time I call this sum function, rather than having eaten 255 cookies, it says I have eaten 265 cookies. Now that is because. Although C++ passes arguments by value by default, we saw how to do it by reference, if you remember, but anyway, this is by value. It passes the value of the pointer. So it just passes the memory location. It's the same location. So when I start messing with stuff in that location, well, that, 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 is that, was the, that was the array, right? So it doesn't make that distinction between a pointer and an array, and that kind of makes things complicated. It saves some memory, not having to copy the whole array, right? Suppose you have a really large array and you want to pass it by value. So it seemed at the time, and we're talking decades ago, and not yet centuries, but it's getting there, uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time to, to deal with arrays this way. It's, it's fast, it's short, um, but it does complicate matters. OK. Um, read this through when you want, but this is more stuff of how Arrays are actually just pointers to their first element. And so you could print out pointers with the same way you can print out energy, anything. You get these hexadecimal numbers that show uh, basically where the memory uh, is located, or what memory you're accessing. So that's bad enough for 1D arrays, but it's, you know, all we have to do is keep track of the pointer and the number of elements. And every time we work with a pointer, if you know those two, we're good. Like, that's doable. Um, how about 2D arrays? Well, it's possible to have 2D arrays in, in automatic arrays, just as we do it with 1D arrays. And this syntax, again, makes perfect sense. You know, I have four dimension, I have two dimensions. Each of them are four. This is a 4 by 4 matrix. And um, you know, let's say that these are by row. So the first row could be filled by 1, 2, 3, 4. The next row by 9, 8, 7, 8, 6, et cetera. And there are hierarchical in a sense. So that makes sense. That's OK. Uh, We'll see that again, just as with uh, one-dimensional arrays. The, the sizes of this array aren't quite known. You can, it's hard to pass them to functions without also specifying the dimensions. But let's first think about how this works, because it is nice even if it's only uh, uh, sort of half supported by the language. So this one's supported. 
It's automatic, it has sizes. And what it does conceptually is kind of funny. So it, you have repeated square braces, which means that essentially we could have, uh, we, could, we could see if this, this has a, a double application of this idea of getting the nth element. So our first application should be, I want the fourth element, or the, the xth element of, of, of data. And then of that, I want yet another element. So what happens is that data is essentially a structure of pointers. There's four pointers, each of which points to a row. So the first one points to this row. So it's four pointers rather than just a block of memory. Now, um, that is because arrays have to be pointers. So this is an array of array. It's just a pointer to a pointer. Now, the first time you think about that, that is, that is somewhat complex. But that's, that's nice in the sense that it generalizes. I can make a 3D array by having a pointer to a pointer to a pointer. You might, might not understand if that's really what it's doing, but it makes sense. It generalizes. The induction works, right? Uh, so I can do a 100-dimensional array if I wanted to. I'm not quite sure if the compiler is happy with that, but you could. And there's no, there's no uh, downside. What happens in, uh, uh, behind the scenes is that we kind of have to choose, if we're doing this, uh, this hierarchical approach of we say, well, it's a pointer of a pointer, we have to kind of say what the last pointer is pointing to. Is it pointing to, in this case, a column, or is it pointing to a, a row? We could have pointers to the rows. So we say, OK, we have these as separate arrays, and then we have an array of pointers to the first element of each. Or we could sort them as rows. And different, lang different languages make different decisions. And that kind of matters because sometimes they need to speak to one another. So the memory layout of arrays in different languages is different. Um, and in C, they're laid out in what's called row major format. That means that each row is, is, is stored, then the next row is stored, and then the next row. The opposite way would be column major, which Fortran does. And it would store 192 first, and then 284. And so essentially, these are transposed of each other, if you want to think about it. But it's just a way of representing a matrix. We think of a matrix in this way. Memory is linear, so we have to, we have to decide whether to store it this way or by column. C++ does it by row, by default. Uh, the automatic arrays also are stored in that sort of a fashion. And it kind of fits in with the way you call it, but that's, that's what Now, this doesn't really belong to this slide, but similarly to when we're passing arrays to a function and we have to supply the size, it gets, even, it gets a little bit hairier here. You have to supply just the first size, the first dimension. The second one you have to code in. It has to be hard-coded. And this is, this is maybe the, one of the worst things about multidimensional arrays in, in C++, uh, as they are in, in as part of the language. Um, for every instance, for every size that is possible, for every second dimension that is possible, I have to have a separate, fun a separate function. Separate function. There's ways to generate them, but this is this is this is crazy, right? We should just be able to say, here's an array. It is n by m, and you know whatever the n and m are, I'll give you the values. Just work with. It. And so automatic arrays don't allow that. They don't allow this idea of having uh, having a function that takes any kind of size. And that's where you should say, well, that's, that's it. Right? Because we want functions, because we want to be modular. Right? We've, we've all been convinced by Marcelo last time that it should be modular. And so we have to move away from automatic arrays. If we just disliked them in 1D and, and they were limited in size, this just changes how we code with these things. That's not good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. So, th so they have to be hard coded, and then you can have an argument for the first one. Yeah. Um, no, I'm sure there's compiler reasons why this is so, but it is just not very useful. So, we have to do something else, and and we kind of have the concept of how we would do this already, because if we think of arrays as pointers to pointers, well, let's just assign these pointers ourselves. Let's allocate them ourselves. Let's have them point at something, and then we'll just have uh, 
will have the final results uh, given to us. So here's one way to do this, and it's, it's sort of the, the standard way that you find textbooks. The code doesn't really do it, per, do it justice. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go forward a little bit, show you how this would be done. So imagine that we are dynamically allocated our, our memory, right? Um, we, can arrive, we can say, OK, it's a four-dimensional matrix. Let's create four. These are pointers. The green ones are pointers. So four pointers. And each of these points at a row it, by itself. And then I'll have a pointer to the first element of my array of pointers. This is this pointer of pointer. It's a little mind modeling, but I hope the picture isn't, isn't so crazy. So this one has, a, has in it the value of where in memory our first row is located, and where in memory the second one is located, and where in memory the first one, the third one is located. And so all we need to access this is this one pointer to the array of pointers. Okay, so that becomes a pointer to a pointer. So a pointer to a pointer looks like this, two stars. So, it, so if p points to an integer, it's an in star. If p points to a pointer that points to an integer, it's an in star star. And uh, we can imagine having uh, allocating our memory exactly in that way. So first we allocate the number of rows we have on pointers. So new int star, int star here is the pointer to an integer. We want four integers. Is it four? Yeah, still four. No, three in this case. The picture is a little bit wrong. So we imagine having three integer, integer pointers. And then each of those gets assigned the number of calls elements. So each of them separately has that. And once I have that in place, I have my pointer to pointer structure, I can use it in the same way. So the, the square brackets that are supposed to work for automatic arrays work for these allocated, dynamically allocated arrays too. The only big difference is that I have to deallocate them myself. So this is buried in this function deallocate mem here, which is on the next slide. Now, you don't really want to do this, right? But this is what happens. This is how these things are laid out. And um, you need to know this. Um, when you're using it, but you don't, you, you'll find a library or you'll write one time, you'll write this and you, you drop it in a function and you say, give me a 2D array and it'll do this for you. But it's a pointer to pointer. This becomes even harder to do. You can imagine with 3D, 4D, 5D, 100 dimensional arrays. Uh, but again, it generalizes. You get pointers to pointers to pointers. To pointers. And so the real thing, the real the sort of take home message of that is that you'll be passing pointers to pointers and passing the size of the, of the array. But then inside, you're just going to use it as if it were an automatic array. Repeated square brackets give you the elements. OK? More or less? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I've made that constant just so I don't accidentally uh, change their values. But it's more of a safeguard. It's a const is a promise. It's not, it's not enforced on the memory. It's enforced on the context. So in this context, it's constant. Yeah, that's, that's all. Yeah. So this point at the point of structure is good. It's what you'll find in C textbooks. It'll, you might find it in some C++ textbooks still. Um, but it has one drawback, and um, it's, an, it's an important one. So I have two versions of the allocation matrix allocation here. And they, in the first one, I, I do this, this same thing as I just said, right? I allocate pointers, and then each pointer points to a, a, a row. And in the second case, I do something more complicated. I, the first one's the same. I, I allocate my pointers. And then I allocate a whole bunch of elements at once, assign them to the zeroth pointer, and then do some sort of arithmetic to get the other pointer. What this amounts to is this. So the first case, it, we just looked at that. 
is taking these pointers and assigning them to locations of rows. And it will work because our square braces will, will pick out the, the relevant elements. The second case does almost the same thing, but by construction has put all of these contiguously, contiguously in memory. So when I allocate one by one, every new statement isn't guaranteed to give a memory address that's adjacent to the previous new statement for various reasons. There might be other things running on a computer or taking other memory. It might actually be beneficial to put some space in between for I don't know what. Um, so doing separate news for each row means that this stuff is not contiguous. Whereas doing one big new, as, as our code did here, and then figuring out where each of the rows starts, which is what the little arithmetic does there, may, means this, this is contiguous. Having it contiguous has two major advantages. Uh, one is speed. Things that are contiguous in memory tend to be loaded faster from memory. And if you're doing uh, mostly just getting memory, getting things from memory and doing something with it, uh, but not too much. If, if your memory is, is your limit, this helps. But secondly, and probably more importantly, a lot of good libraries, well-optimized libraries for things like linear algebra expect this data to be contiguous. If it's not, the library won't work. So now you're off implementing your own linear algebra routines, doing it not as fast as those people that have spent their whole lives and their whole careers on making optimized versions of these. Uh, so your code is slower, not just because it's not contiguous, but because you had to write your own routines and the libraries don't work. So that's a waste, right? We don't want that. So we're going to use contiguous ones whenever we can. We'll prefer allocate matrix to just so that when we're going to link to libraries, we, were, we are not going to be restricted to what libraries we use. We can, just, we can use the, uh, the best and, and, and brightest. OK. This, by the way, is also kind of how automatic arrays do it anyway. So this brings you closer to the ideal of having automatic arrays, uh, but with, at the cost of doing a little bit of legwork. Uh, do note that when you choose one or the other, your deallocation is different. For every new, there has to be a delete. So I have had a new for each row. There's a delete for each row. Whereas if I don't, I just need two delete statements, one for the block of data and one for the pointers. Right? So one for this block and one for that. Each block has one. So how you allocate determines how you deallocate. OK, so that's, so that's how so we have row, major matrices that are row by row. We know how to make them contiguous. We know how to dynamically allocate them, so size is not an issue. And because they're contiguous, we will be able to use uh, libraries that do the linear algebra for us, and we don't have to do it ourselves. Uh, good. Now, let's make sure we, we use this to our advantage. So, Yes, our memory is laid out contiguously by row, right? Uh, but that means that we should use that knowledge. When we're writing a loop that goes over all rows and all columns, say to sum up all of the elements, we could do it in various ways. We could first sum over i and then sum over j or, or the opposite way. Mathematically, same result, right? Sum, sum by first each row and then sum the rows or go by column. But the way I traverse memory in both cases is different. In, it, in one case, I go linearly through memory, so like that. And that's if I do the row in the inner loop, right? If the, sorry, if the column in, index is, the, is in the inner loop, that's how I go linearly. But if I went the opposite way, so do j first and then i, I would go 1, 9, 2, 6, then 2, 8, 4. And that kind of hopping around in memory turns out to be costly. We have some time. We'll go over why it's costly, but it's, it's better to stream things. Things are, as it were, buffered. So if, you, if that makes any sense, uh, you want to access things as they're laid out in memory. That makes our first version much faster, because as j varies, we just go to the next element in, in memory. This one 
especially for larger matrix, can easily be 10 times slower than the other. So this isn't a small, subtle effect. This, this is important. So knowing that it's row, uh, row major means our last index is going to be our inner loop. If, we're going, if you're programming in Fortran, it'd be exactly the opposite way. There we go. C++ is row major. Loop over blocks. Make sure the inner, inner loop is going linearly in, in, in memory. Sure? Sorry, where's the Hangouts? Stop sharing. Oh. You are sharing, you're sharing, stop, stop sharing, hide. It says it's sharing, no? Screen. Share. Sharing. Strange. You ask him what he's seeing. Is he seeing anything? Very odd. Hmm. Wait. Okay, you can't really solve that right now. Um, sorry about that. OK, uh, where were we? OK, so that's what happens. And even if we're going to look at existing libraries, this is still what's happening underneath, right? Um, you have either row, column, major, major matrices, or larger dimensional uh, structures. Um, you want to be able to go through them. But, and they will have to do all, this, all of this dynamic allocation for you, right? Uh, we either do it ourselves, or we have libraries do it. So I'm going to have a few libraries, uh, pick a few libraries that can do this. And what tends to be the case is that once people write a library for, or they can do matrices, they can't help but write a routine that multiplies matrices or does matrix vector multiplication. And probably for good reason, but that's, that's what happens. If they're good, and the ones that I mentioned are good, uh, they won't just write those themselves. They will link those to existing BLAST and LAPEC libraries, which are these high-performing linear algebra uh, libraries that I was talking about. So they will have to make sure that things are laid out contiguously, et cetera. So there's no shortage on the possible uh, packages. Armadillo is one. Eigen is another. This++ plus plus is a little older, but it's still there. Boost has a multidimensional array uh, sub-library. Uh, R array, which is my own creation that I've had for a long time before these things existed. So um, They will all do. Matrix multiplications, inversions, so, well, not all, but they'll do things like that, um, which can be useful. So you can buy into a, one of them. They're not necessarily all interoperable. Okay? You know, um, so I'll pick out uh, two, actually three. Um, I'll pick out Eigen, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about RRA, um, which is the, the more modest one of the, of the bunch. And, and I'll show you how. You would find it in C++ books, which you should not. So this is going to be a warning. These packages are good. Your C++ textbooks that tells you to use vectors is wrong. So a first example, here's Eigen. Uh, the example fell a little bit out of, of, off of the slide, but there's nothing after return zero except the curly basis. So I can make two by two matrices in Eigen. It's a, it's a library. You install it. You include a header file that will have the definitions of these eigenmatrices. Uh, as you can imagine, if you know anything about linear algebra, this probably comes from the fact that they can do eigenvalues, but uh, it's really just a matrix package. Um, so once that's included, I can have eigenmatrices, say eigen float 2, 2. That's a 2 by 2 matrices, and I have two of them. That's kind of nice. kind of like an automatic array. And I should warn you, it is like an automatic array. This is just an example. Uh, but the same kind of syntax works for dynamically allocated arrays. So, and then you can fill this matrix with a bunch of numbers. It has this nice syntax. 
of, uh, of streaming numbers in it, and that fills the matrix. And the same with B. And then I can do things like, oh, this should have been a B, sorry. Uh, print A, print B, print A plus B, do A minus B, multiply A with a, a number. Um, and so when I compile that and run it, it'll give you the matrix A, the matrix B, what its sum is, what the difference is, what, what happens if I multiply. So it has all those nice, nice features in it. Um, it's not right. You can do things like matrix multiplication, uh, matrix vector multiplication, transposes. It's a really nice package, and it's fairly, it's, it's pretty efficient. Like it's, it's well done. Um, so multiply, transposes. You can even solve linear equations using what's called an LU decomposition. This goes back to your linear algebra. Uh, so. If you don't know what it is, just gloss over this. But it can do those things. Do eigenvalues. Very nice. Okay. So if you decide to use this, perfectly fine. No problem with that. Um, do keep in mind that I think this actually stores things in column major formats. It's the only downside I can think of. And um, and that, it's a downside because it means that you can't use them in the, like, in the same code with like, a function that expects something in row major format, unless you specifically transpose them or say it is a transpose. So it, it's, it's kind, of a, kind of a funny decision. Yeah. By default. No, but it does mean that if, you, if it's by column, that the way you, you should traverse your loops should now be reversed. OK? So, so look this up, because, because I, I was looking at too many packages. So I don't, it can do both, because specified is probably the best idea to do, uh, because then you're specific and you know what you're doing. But it does mean that if you had a piece of code that worked for your original array and you're just transforming it into eigen, uh, you might have to reverse loops. And that's not particularly nice. It also doesn't work, as you say, as you see, it has a little bit of a funny, different syntax. I shouldn't say funny, but a different syntax to find, say, the three, three elements, uh, where it's not repeated square braces, but it, but it is parentheses, which is an, maybe a more natural way to do it, but it's not a C++ way. So again, if you have a code that works on a matrix, and you know, say, now I'm going to use an eigen matrix, you, you will have to rewrite it. So that's, that's one of the downsides. The good, the good side is everything is in there. You could be completely consistent just using, using eigen. These guys are because I've, I've hard-coded two and two. If I put in something that, I forgot what the exact name is, but something like dynamic, I could, after the fact, say how big they are. And that would be dynamic. So uh, this is just an example. But a better example would have this dynamic and would, would allocate it. The nice thing about these, these kind of libraries is that uh, these, are, these are essentially objects, and they know uh, how to deallocate themselves when they're no longer needed. And so you won't have to do explicit deallocations if you use this. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a really nice added bonus. So I want to show a second example, which does a lot less. Um, it basically tries to do what we just did with creating pointer to pointer arrays. It's called R arrays for runtime arrays. So um, at runtime, you can say how big your arrays are, and they will be allocated always dynamically. Um, and apart from the syntax being slightly different in that it has this template form where you say what the type is and how many dimensions there are, uh, you can just create a 3x3x3 three by three by three array and fill it with something and use the same square bracket notation because it's essentially doing this pointer to pointer structure for you. Uh, what this has over Eigen and other packages is that uh, you can have as many dimensions as you, as you would like. So it's not restricted to matrices and vectors, which, which Eigen really is. Um, and, and because it's doing this pointer to pointer structure that we all know and love, it's, it's as fast as that structure. So some packages, Eigen is an exception, some packages like Armadillo and so they add a layer of abstraction that does have a cost set 
do it. So uh, this is trying to have none of that cost. So it'll print it out a little bit funnily with curly braces, but if you read the documentation, I'll tell you why. Uh, and then the third example that I, I, must, uh, I must mention, because it, you'll find it in textbooks, is to just use this vector class. So a vector class is just an array. So you can imagine, OK, you have an array of floats, and it's, it's uh, allocated dynamically. It can grow. So you can have 100 elements, and you can say, well, now I want it to have 200 elements, and I'll do that for you. And I'll, that sounds wonderful. Um, but it has a lot of overhead, especially if you want to create multidimensional arrays, because you have to create vectors of vectors of vectors. Okay, so And then, although you're doing that, this nice idea of, of creating it, of not having to allocate things, is, 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 is not correct. You still have to reserve for each row and each slab in your 3D structure, you have to reserve the elements. So you're basically back to allocating your, your arrays manually. Um, the only plus side is the deallocation is automatic. But there's also no way, if you do this, to make sure that the elements are contiguous. These are separately allocated vectors. Uh, it's an array of vectors. It doesn't, it doesn't have any restriction on being contiguous uh, when you do it in this multidimensional way. So it's slow. It's ugly. It's non-contiguous. Um, it's not fit for scientific computing. This might serve you well if you have a two by two array and you don't want to do anything. Um, but no. OK, so let's not use this one. Uh, there are some more slides on, on our arrays. If you, uh, uh, it's very, it's a light, it's supposed to be lightweight. I think I'll, I'll have a little exercise for you to, to play with it. But um, this is the overview. Um, it, does, it does a lot of things as you would want them. It, it dynamically allocates, it deallocates by itself. Elements are, are the same way as automatic arrays. And if you have automatic arrays, you can convert them to one of those as well. So you don't have to write a separate function for each size of your automatic arrays anymore. You just make the function take an R array instead, and you convert them to R arrays, um, which, is, which doesn't cost all that much. It can do output and input. Okay. So, and you can, and, and this is something that's nice. Eigen has this too, but you can return an array from a function too. So that's that's a little bit that's just nice. And this this one I do want to mention, and and um, it's it's optional, and some of the packages have this too. You can you can switch on bound checking, so you can check if you're going off the end of the array by compiling uh, in a specific way. So that having this option available for debugging is useful. It makes things horribly slow, but you know finding a bug might be worth it. OK, you can write things out. The homework, uh, I've thought about it, but I haven't finalized it. So uh, later this afternoon, we'll post it on the site. There'll be something with arrays and something with Git. You can bet on that. Um, so all right, any last questions? Three-ish, yeah. OK. Homework. Okay. So is it done? Yeah. Or that, yeah, you it. don't have to submit it or anything. It's not. It's not good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. He's supposed to send me an email. Okay, so you don't need to compile the header file. Okay, the header file will just have um, 
like the points were to, like the, the name of the function to be defined by the other files. So this should work. So we never do that. So, so we never compile the uh, header file. Right, so the header file is, is um, so let's take a look at the header file. No, no. So what will happen is that after, after tonight, you won't be able to modify it. Oh, these are complicated. <laughs> uh, so the header file will have definitions. That's fine. It has the includes that you need, but then it has there is no basically uh, how to say um, things going on. They are beyond. Uh, so this is a header file for op for options, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, it has definition of the options types and things like that. But they don't have the method; it has just the, the, the like the header of the of the functions, right? So the make file. So in the make file, uh, basically, you don't need to have this line. Okay, so let me. Oops. All right, comment right. out this line here. Um, and have a, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so what happens is that it happens to be that there was a zero. Well, there's no way else, right? There, there's no reason oh, for it. And, and this is why sometimes when you make mistakes, we're sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because you might have to have a zero. But then the next time you run, so I'm not saying you can see clean. Yeah, you can clean it. Uh, should look, there should be a project. Project. You want me to take it? Uh, okay. So, so the issue is, okay. remember, let me. Yeah. So you can't build everything. Has to, uh, Tell you because these are not the most optimized ones. Right. Um, 